alumnus here on the South Campus. And I'd like, you, I'd like to welcome you to our first Science Seminar at South uh, Lecture Series event. Um, this is the very first inaugural uh, event, and we're really grateful to see everybody here. Thank you for coming. Uh, the series uh, will happen once a month, and uh, you should see social media postings and posters up around campus, and uh, your faculty, uh, your instructors will let you know when they're happening. Uh, they're usually, this semester, they'll be on Mondays or Wednesdays at one o'clock. Uh, we have a, another uh, speaker coming up in October, and he's a, a medical professor from the University of Florida. He's going to talk about brain chemistry and addiction, so that should be a, an interesting talk. The purpose of this is to uh, just provide you with some fun, interesting, and relevant talks on science. Uh, some of these talks will talk about things that are very uh, closely related to Florida. Uh, today's talk, we'll talk about some oceanography, uh, a, big, uh, a big topic here in Florida. Others will talk about things that relate uh, to everyday life. Uh, the next month's talk will be about addiction, something that unfortunately touches a lot of lives. And uh, we want the talks to be fun and interesting. Uh, I want you to see that science is not uh, the purview of just people in, in lab coats. Uh, tucked away in labs somewhere. Uh, scientists are people just like you. Uh, there's an interesting statistic that I read just the other day. 20 to 30 percent of all PhD holding scientists and engineers in the United States started at a community college. Right? So they were sitting right where you were, right where you are now, at some point in their career, and they made it all the way to the doctorate. And are now professors and engineers and research scientists. Okay, well, without uh, further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, this month's speaker. Heather Bracken Grissom uh, is, is our speaker, and she's going to tell us about uh, deep sea mysteries, monster larvae, and the evolution of bioluminescence. And uh, she earned her bachelor's degree at the University of California, and then a PhD at the University of Louisiana at Lafayette. Uh, before coming to FIU, she worked as a researcher, a postdoc at Brigham Young University for four years. And just recently, in 2012, she joined the biology faculty at Florida International University. So uh, let's give Dr. Brecken Grissom a warm welcome. of that excitement. So today, my talk is going to be divided into two components. The first component is going to be the discovery of new species and trying to identify these strange and bizarre creatures that we find in the deep sea. And the second part is going to be on some new research I've just started in my lab, which is on the evolution of bioluminescence. So before we get started, I wanted to introduce you to the deep sea environment. This is a unique combination of harsh, harsh conditions. We know that this can be a hard environment to live in. Organisms that live in the deep sea need a unique set of adaptations. Light, we know that light does penetrate up to about a thousand meters, but when you get much deeper than that, you have almost complete darkness no sunlight, and hence no photosynthesis. There's also increased pressure. This pressure increases at about one atmosphere with every 10 meters. So when we get to the really abyssal depths, that pressure is extremely immense. Salinity and temperature remain rather constant. 
And at about a thousand meters, the temperature is pretty stable. It ranges anywhere from one to six degrees Celsius. And there's not much of a seasonal change to that. So what exactly is considered the deep sea? So we hear a lot of people um, saying the deep sea this, the deep sea that, but I wanted to break it down into these stratified layers for you so you can see what the talk today focuses on and what I'm, the areas of the, the ocean that I'm going to be talking about. So we have the top 200 meters here. This is the epipelagic. This is what most of you are familiar with. This is about 200 meters and less, equivalent to about 600 feet. This is where photosynthesis can occur, sunlight, sunlight can fully penetrate, and you're probably familiar with some of the organisms that are living in, in this stratified layer. If you move a little deeper, you have the middle layer, which is called the mesopelagic. This ranges from about 200 meters down to 1,000. It's also termed the twilight zone, and that's because sunlight can still penetrate, although weakly it does, it can, there is some light up to about 1,000 meters. And this is where a lot of these bioluminescent organisms actually reside. If you move much deeper into the bathypelagic, which ranges from about 1,000 to 4,000 meters, this is where we start to encounter absolutely no light, uh, complete lack of light, no, um, and very low temperatures. And finally, we go into the final de depth, the abyssal zone, which is about 4,000 meters plus, and again, no sunlight, immense pressure, and the areas I'm gonna focus on today are really going to be two areas, the, the, the mesopelagic and the bathypelagic. And so that's when I'm saying deep sea, those are the areas that I'm referring to. So there's a wide distribution of organisms in the, in the ocean. These organisms, depending on where they're living, are definitely have different unique adaptations depending on, depending on where they're situated in the water column. So as I mentioned before, you have organisms that we're all familiar with. In the epipelagic, that first 200 meters, you have jellyfish, you have sponges, you have coral, fish, algae, shrimp. All of these are photosynthetic, um, or all of, this is where photosynthesis can occur, so there's a lot of productivity. And as we move a little deeper into those midwaters, the mesopelagic, bathypelagic, we start to see a shift in organisms. We still see common things like shrimp, jellyfish, fish, these are different species, but they definitely have different adaptations. So one common theme that runs across many organisms that, beca that can be found in these mid-regions are the color, and that color is typically this red. So this typical red kind of coloration, um, and, and this is because red, this is for camouflage, red light can't penetrate very deep uh, through the water, so a lot of organisms in this midwater are actually red. And then as we move down into the, into the bathypelagic and the, the, the benthic, the abyssal depths, we see organisms that have adaptations due to limited food. Food is often very limited, temperatures are very low, organisms tend to move a little bit slower, metabolism is reduced, um, and this is, this is really in order to cope with the lack of food in, in that environment. So, so, mid so deep, you can imagine deep sea research is a difficult task. It's not only expensive, it's also hard to collect at a few hundred meters depth. You need specialized equipment, you need advanced technology. Most of this is done off of big research vessels. Sometimes you need remote operated vehicles. So, so deep sea research didn't really begin until the 1800s. Um, there was a lot of advancements around that time which allowed us to explore some of these, these new regions. And when we started to explore these regions in the 1800s, scientists really came up with, came up with some 
bizarre, never previously seen organisms such as these. So, so we would go and we would collect these things and we would reveal these totally bizarre and mysterious creatures, things that people had never seen before. These organisms could not be identified. They looked nothing like their, their surface representatives. So, so researchers just kind of scratched their heads and didn't really know what to do with these, with these strange organisms. So, as I mentioned before, uh, many of these species were actually described as new species. They had no idea how to classify them, who were their close relatives, and they really eluded early scientists because of their unique physical characteristics or their, un their unique morphology. Like I mentioned, they didn't represent anything these scientists had seen before. And this is the introduction to the very beginning of, of my talk. I'm going to introduce you to one of these examples. We, in 2009, my research team rediscovered one of these, these strange midwater organisms that was first described in the early 1800s. So, so this is where the talk starts and also this is, this is the first component of it. So this, this part of the talk, I'm, I'm calling the 180-year-old monster mystery. And it starts in 2009. The initial discovery was off of a research vessel, and we went out into the Gulf of Mexico. This, this uh, exploration was funded by NOAA. We went aboard the NOAA research vessel. This is called the Gordon Gunter. It's a, a research vessel. And we went into the northern part of the Gulf of Mexico. You see Florida here, and the mission was really to go out and collect a bunch of decapod crustaceans, which are your shrimp, your lobsters, and your crabs. So the main part, of, the main focus was to go out, collect organisms, look for new new species and, and new discoveries. So some of the methods we use when we're out on a research vessel, I just wanted to kind of introduce these to you. The first is, it's called dredging. And the type of dredge that we typically use, these are dredges that are pulled behind the boat, are dredges that looked, look extremely similar to, the, to dredges that were used all the way back in the 1800s when this first, these first, this first research uh, came to be. These dredges are typically metal boxes that drag along the, the bottom of the ocean floor. They get dragged for about 20 minutes and they collect anything they come upon. We also have another collection method. This is midwater trawling, which is similar to shrimp trawling. So you just, it's basically the same exact thing. You connect a large net to the back of the boat. Again, this net is suspended in the water column, so it, instead of being on the bottom of the ocean floor, it's suspended up, and you collect for about 20 minutes, and you bring it up. And the last method that we typically use on some of these cruises are plankton toes. These plankton toads just skim the surface and collect any organisms that are residing on that top layer of the ocean. And this mesh size can be a variety of different sizes depending on what you're targeting and what you're looking for. So these are the three methods we used on that, on that boat. And this is just a few pictures from directly on board to show you how the collection kind of works and how the sorting happens. So this is another one of our research vessels in Louisiana that we often go out into the Gulf of Mexico. This is a picture of a benthic skimmer. It's kind of like a dredge. This is a large skimmer that drags along the bottom of the ocean floor. We bring up the benthic skimmer. We dump all the contents out onto a sorting tray into the back of the boat, which usually has a pretty large deck so we can work off of everything. We sort through anything we can find, the rocks, the rubble, the debris, and we typically end up with something that looks like this. So this is a haul from 
um, a, a deep sea uh, skimmer that actually was about 1,500 feet, so about 500 meters. And you'll see a variety of crabs. You'll also see some shrimp and some weird looking lobsters, okay? So this is typically what we bring up on, on one, at one station. So we were really excited because we were able to find this little guy. This is called Ceratospis monstrosa. This was collected as part of that research cruise. It was collected in about 420 meters, which is equivalent to about 1,260 feet. And like I mentioned before, this was collected in the northern Gulf of Mexico. And we were so excited about this because this guy was first discovered back in 1828. It's only been seen a handful of times since that initial discovery. After the, after the research cruise, we collected one of these, okay? So, so it was discovered, just about the initial discovery, it was discovered in 1828 by a gentleman named Gray, and the initial discovery was in the gut contents of a dolphin. So these things are typically found within the gut contents of large predatory fish. If you actually look at the original species description, it's pretty interesting because he didn't know what to make of it. He called it, in the, in the actual text, if you read it, he called it a monstrous and misshapen animal. And it's really eluded definitive placement for almost 200 years. So no one's known who its close relatives are, what the true identity of, of this species is. So there are some hints and some physical characteristics that have eluded that it might be closely related to some kind of shrimp, but it's still been really a mystery up until just a few years ago. And like I mentioned before, Ceratospis monstrosa is extremely rare in the wild, typically found within gut contents, and it's only been collected a handful of times. So this is just what the original description back in 1828, this was originally described in a manuscript called New and Unfigured Animals. And then back in 1966, there was some other scientists that found a few more specimens and made some early illustrations of Ceratospis monstrosa seen here. It does seem to have a wide distribution. So it's been collected a handful of times, but it's been collected all over the world. Um, you can see Florida here. It's also being collected off of Africa, Europe, below Madagascar, the tip of South Africa, and then also in the Western Pacific Ocean off of, um, off of China and Hong Kong. So what we wanted to do was really to identify this thing. And the way we were going to identify it was to use genetic methods. So use DNA sequencing in order to identify what this organism was. Much like they use forensic evidence or DNA sequencing in forensics cases today. So we use something called barcoding methods, which I'm going to explain to you in just a second, in order to reveal the true identity of, of this organism. And we also use something called phylogenetic methods, which I'm going to talk about also in just a second to look at who the closest relatives of this species actually are. Okay, so like I mentioned before, we were only able to find one specimen, and we extracted DNA from that one specimen. It was pretty nerve-wracking. I mean, this specimen is about the size of my pinky fingernail, and I have very small hands, so you can imagine that's pretty small. And we extracted muscle tissue, we extracted DNA, and again, we use two methods, barcoding and phylogenetic methods. And I'm just going to briefly describe what those are now, if you haven't heard of them. So DNA barcoding is actually a pretty simple concept. It's, in, in the most general sense, it's a method that you use to identify an organism. So 
So much like if you were to go, we're all familiar with, with going to a grocery store. Every single item in that grocery store is identified by a unique numerical code or a, a, a unique set of numbers known as a barcode. So it's the same exact concept where every species that's living today can be identified by a unique DNA sequence. And that unique DNA sequence, as I mentioned, it's, it's different from species to species. It's the same within a species. So we typically use a 600 base pair DNA sequence. Um, again, so when I'm saying 600 base pairs, I'm talking about nucleotides, so A's, C's, G's, and T's. And, and, and we use this unique sequence to help identify species. So an example would be if we had, so here's just an example to help you visualize what this might look like. If we have here four different species, we have species A, species B, species C, and species D. And each of these different species have, has a unique DNA sequence. And we color code all of those bases. So we color code A, G, C, and T to be a different color. You can see that species A can be distinguished from B, C, and D based on that, that DNA sequence. You can also see why they call it a DNA barcode because if you color code those nucleotides, it actually looks exactly um, like a barcode would in, on an item in a, in a grocery store. So that's the first method we use. We use DNA barcoding to try to identify this this organism. We also used a method called phylogenetics. And phylogenetics is a field of science. This is just a study of how organisms are related to one another. And a phylogenetic tree is just a way to visualize these relationships. And I'm going to walk you through a really simple example so that you can help, ident help interpret some of the results that we, that we received. So how do we build phylogenetic trees? The first thing we use can be a set or a suite of morphological characters or physical characters. So this can be any kind of character um, that can infer uh, relatedness. And these characters can be physical characters, they can be developmental characters, or they can be fossil characteristics. So here I have just three examples. I have a crayfish. I have a shrimp and I have a mantis shrimp here. And say we wanted to compare physical characters and start to make inferences on who's related to who. So the first thing we might look at is legs, so the number of legs. And if we start counting these things up, we see that a crayfish has 10 legs, the shrimp has 10, and the mantis shrimp has 6. We might also look at whether the appendages are clawed or not clawed. And you can see the crayfish and the shrimp. You can't really see it here, but both of these have clawed appendages, whereas a mantis shrimp has this club-like club -like appendage. And we might look at something like abdominal segments. So how many seg segments are present on the abdomen? And again, we see the crayfish and the shrimp have very similar number of abdominal segments when compared to the stomatopod. So we can start to make inferences about which organisms are more similar based on morphology. But what I really want to focus on is the genetic evidence, and this is what we used in this study. So, so here we just have a really simplified um, DNA sequence for a crab, a shrimp, and a stomatopod. In real life when we're doing this, you can imagine that this sequence is hundreds of thousands of, of base pairs long. But we can start looking at, we can use complex models and algorithms to start doing analyses using genetic data to see who's most likely related to who. And if we just base it on percent similarity in this case, you can see that, you can start to see who's, who's more similar to each other. So if I were to present to you four phylogenetic trees, a, B, C, and D. This is where I'm going to ask you to say something. <laughs> which phylogenetic hypothesis or which tree do you guys think are, is right? 
So I'm going to go through them. Who thinks A? B? C? D? Okay? So B is right, but D is also right. Okay? So these two trees are telling you the exact same thing. All right? They're just... They're just visualized a little bit differently. Both of these trees are showing that the crayfish and the shrimp are more closely related to one another than they are to the stomatopod. So phylogenies, this is a phylogeny. Phylogenies allow you to visualize relatedness between organisms, and they also allow you to map characters. And this becomes important when we start talking about bioluminescence. So we can, map, we can map some characters, we can start tracing these across our tree. For example, the six-segmented abdomen was shared by both the crayfish and the shrimp. So we can, we can note that on the tree where we saw that character first appear. Whereas the ten-segmented abdomen was only unique to the stomatopod. Likewise, we can look at legs. Ten legs were unique to crayfish and shrimp, whereas six was unique to the stomatopod. And you can also do this with DNA data. So if we go back to that table and we take that second position within our, within our DNA table, we can see that every single individual, the stomatopod, the crayfish, and the shrimp, all had an A at that second position. So that character or that trait is shared between all three. So let's get into our results. So what did we find? So when we used DNA barcoding, we sequenced several genes. We sequenced that traditional 600 base pair fragment, but we also wanted to sequence a bunch of other fragments um, to make sure that we weren't making wrong inferences. And we compared our DNA sequence that we got from Ceratospis monstrosa to a public database. This database has millions of DNA sequences that we can compare it against, and we ended up with a 99.95 .95 genetic match. So that was pretty exciting. It hit on something in the database, so we knew that we were getting towards the right, we were headed in the right direction. So we also built a phylogenetic tree, and this is too bad because this is kind of shows you what's, what happens here, but we actually found out that the phylogenetic tree showed this organism, which is Ceratospis monstrosa. It was identical to a deep sea shrimp. And this deep sea shrimp looks completely different from this organism right here. So this shrimp was hitting identical to, to this to this um, Ceratospis monstrosa, and we were saying, how could that be? How could these two things that look very different be identical? And, and the, the answer was that this was actually the larval form of that adult shrimp. So we were able to make this, this linkage between the larvae and the adult, this really enhances our understanding of biodiversity and classification. It helped us solve a long-standing enigma. It solved that 180-year that mystery. And it also allows us to make inferences about other species that look very similar. So there's other species of Ceratospis, and there's other genera, and we can, we can make inferences that those are also probably deep sea shrimp, and we have an idea of what, of what organisms to target. It also provides insight to the ecology and the life history of a species. So we know that this larvae lives in about 500 meters, where the adult is actually a truly abyssal species. So we know that the larvae need to migrate down from 500 meters to 5,000 meters at some point of their life in their life, and it actually also identified the source population of a very important food source. So I told you that these larvae are typically a common prey item for these large migratory fish, such as tuna, mahi mahi, and a few others. So it established the identity of, of where these prey items are found. And I hope I also convinced you that molecular techniques, at least in this case, 
really are helpful in identifying the organisms. You can imagine, typically, when these, these organisms are caught, they have to be reared under laboratory protocols that can take months, weeks to months, um, can take a really long time. And using molecular techniques, we can obtain these DNA sequences and help link the identity of some of these things. So here are some cool pictures. I apologize that the other one didn't show up. But these are some of the larvae that I showed you earlier in the talk. This here is a picture of a lophogastrid. This is a crustacean. Um, the adult looks something like this. So you can see these are drastically different morphologies. And it's really hard by just looking at the larvae to actually identify what the adult might be. This, might, this is an example that's a little bit closer to home. This is the larvae of a spiny lobster, which some of you probably have seen before, either uh, while you're snorkeling in South Florida or maybe on a dinner plate, if you like that sort of thing. Um, I, I do. Uh, but these are totally weird looking, weird, bizarre looking creatures. And the last one I wanted to show you, this is a stomatopod, so I showed you a mantis shrimp a little bit earlier, and this is actually what the larvae looks like here. So I'm going to switch gears just a little bit. I'm going to go from the discovery of new species, identifying these weird larval forms, to something that's a little bit more recent in my lab and something we've started to study, which is bioluminescence. So I'm going to look at the evolution of bioluminescence in the marine environment, and I'm going to be using deep sea shrimp as a model organism. So in the marine environment, bioluminescence is really an essential survival tool. Many organisms use bioluminescence for communication, for defense, and also to attract, to attract prey items. So you're probably, probably familiar with a lot of these organisms that are featured here. We have squid that are bioluminescent. bioluminescent. We have jellyfish, fish, and also the one that we're going to be talking about today, which are, which are shrimp, different types of shrimp species. And there's about 700 genera that are bioluminescent. Out of those 700 genera, about 80% live in the marine, in the marine, in our marine world. So a really common system that we see not only in the marine environment, but in the terrestrial environment, is this luciferin-luciferase system. You probably have heard of this system before in fireflies. This is the system that fireflies use to flash. It's also the system that's used in other organisms such as bacteria, jellyfish, squid, and the system that I'm going to be talking about today, which is, which is shrimp. And how this, how this system works is that we have luciferin, which is a substrate. There's a chemical reaction which occurs between the substrate luciferin and an enzyme luciferase. And a byproduct of this chemical reaction is the production of light. So that's what's creating the actual flash that you see, or as we're going to see, a bioluminescent secretion. Within shrimp, there's many bioluminescent shrimp. You're probably not aware of that. But there's a few different families. The family that we're going to be talking about today are these shrimp. They're called opalphorids. They're midwater shrimp. They live, they live in the anywhere from the mesopelagic to the bathypelagic. And there's also a variety of other families, pendalidae, surgestids, that are also bioluminescent. But today we're going to really focus on this family, again, the opalphorid shrimp. Now, there's about 70 species of opalphorids. There's just a few pictures here, about 10 genera that are still living. As I mentioned before, this gives you a really good example of these midwater organisms, how a lot of them are this deep red color. 
These are found in the mesopelagic and also the bathypelagic regions all over the world. They have this cosmopolitan distribution and some species within opalophorids participate in the largest migratory event on our planet. That migratory event is this diurnal, it's called a diurnal migration. Every night, some of these species migrate from, from these bathypelagic depths up into surface waters to feed. And they do this every single day, along with hundreds and thousands of other planktonic species. So they do this every day, they do it primarily to avoid predators and to get into those regions that are more plentiful in food. So they have a really cool bioluminescent system. They have two different modes of bioluminescence, which I'm going to introduce to you right now. The first is this bioluminescent secretion, which every single species within the opalophorids does. So all 70 of those species can produce this bioluminescent secretion. This is an ad adaptation that they've, that they've acquired as a defense mechanism, primarily when they get startled, this, this secretion is emitted from the base of the, their antennae and, and it's usually used to uh, startle prey. I don't know how good this guy actually did, um, if it worked or not, but we'll see. So, a, so there's a few others, not all, that have a second form of bioluminescence and that's called a photophore. And these photophores are, are pictured here. There are these little purple dots that are along the surface of the shrimp. They can be, they can be all along the surface. They're also for, they can also be found along the legs and along the ventral, the underside of the belly of the shrimp. Um, and Again, this is present in some, but not all. So we, I told you that the secretion is used in defense, and, and the, the photophores are actually you, thought to be used in, or have been shown to be used in counter-illumination and camouflage. So in case you're not familiar with what counter-illumination is, I've provided a little picture here. So I told you that these photophores bioluminesce, and a lot of them are situated on the underside of the belly of fish, shrimp, squid, and so they're used to camouflage the organism. So you can imagine that you are a big fish and you're swimming below. So you're swimming underneath these two organisms and you're looking up for prey items. So what this, what this photophore illumination is supposed to kind of mimic is downwelling sunlight. So if you're a fish swimming underneath these things and you're looking up and all you're seeing is light, you can mistake that organism for just, for just downwelling sunlight. So it's really hard to see. And that's actually what this picture is showing you. Here is, is, a, is a photophore luminescence from a fish and that would be underneath looking up. So you can see it can be used pretty effectively in camouflage. So one of the questions that we're currently asking in my lab is how did these two, how and why did these two different modes of bioluminescence evolve? So I already mentioned to you that all 10 genera bioluminesce. Um, they all have the secretion. So all of them here are so this just indicates that they can all produce the secretion, but only three out of the ten genera, these top three, can actually produce this photophore luminescence. So we used phylogenetics again. We wanted to ask, we wanted to look at how these, these ones that have the photophore and the secretion, how they're related to one another. And you don't really need to worry about the small text or reading anything, but what we found when we built these phylogenetic trees, and this phylogenetic tree was built using, again, was just built using genetic data, so we used about 6,500 DNA uh, base pairs of, of DNA sequence data, and we found that every single 
species that had this photophore luminescence and the secretion luminescence grouped together. So these were more closely related to one another than are the ones that just have the secretion. So the next thing we can do is once we know a little bit about evolutionary relationships, how these things are related to one another, we can do something called ancestral state reconstruction. And what this allows us to do is actually, it allows us to model what we think the ancestors looked like for these shrimp groups. So if you take a look, this is again another tree. So here are all the species that we used in our tree. Every single species was coded as either having, so green here is just the secretion, and black is the species that had the secretion and the photophores. So once you code the, Libby, the present species in your tree as having one of those two different modes of bioluminescence, we can actually use analyses to reconstruct what the ancestors might have looked like. And we found that photophores evolved once during the evolution of this group, right here. So this is where the first, the first organism that had photophores was situated. And we also concluded that the ancestor to every single shrimp in this tree did have only the, the, the bioluminescence that, that had the secretion. So I just wanted to kind of point that out to show you that you can, phylogenies don't only show you how organisms are related to one another, but you can also trace interesting characters, whether it be bioluminescence or development. You can also trace distributions, how things, how things are distributed in, in biogeography. So you can use phylogenies as a tool to answer a lot of interesting questions about ecology, development, and biogeography of, of a species. So we learned a little bit about the evolution, but we wanted to know why. Why did shrimp actually develop these two forms of bioluminescent? Why, are, why do some have photophores while others don't? And the first one kind of links back to this counter-illumination that I introduced you to, to just a while ago. So the first hypothesis is that the, these photophores have evolved in, in shrimp that tend to inhabit shallower waters and need counter-illumination for protection. So you can imagine that only shrimp that migrate into really shallow waters where sunlight is still visible would need these, these, these type of photophore illumination because, because they are used in, in counter-illumination. And interesting enough, all the shrimp that contain the photophores do migrate into these shallow waters where sunlight can still be detected. And if you look at clade two, those shrimp that only have the secretion, they don't tend to migrate into shallow waters where sunlight is found at all, or they don't migrate at all. So this tends to be an adaptation to that diurnal migration into shallow, shallower waters to feed. So the last thing I'm going to talk about today is some current research we have going on. And the last, what we're currently looking at is we want to, we want to explore this a little bit more. We want to look at how visual systems are adapted. So how, how, do the, how are the shrimp detecting these two different modes of bioluminescence? Because there is another story and another layer of complexity that can be added to this, to this phenomenon. And the interesting thing is that the photophores actually emit a different wavelength of light. So photophores emit a light that is in the UV, has a UV range, whereas the secretion emits a light that is in this blue-green range. So we want to start looking at the visual systems, how they're identified, how they're identifying the bioluminescence. Are they actually using the bioluminescence to communicate, or, or what they actually are using it for. So with that, I just want to thank you for listening today. I hope you learned a little bit something. And, and this, this type of research for me 
it, it's really exciting. Um, I love kind of exploring things that are challenging and that are also unknown and that can kind of stretch the imagination. So with that, I'd like to thank Broward College for the invitation and Dean Poland for inviting me. Also thank some universities that have been involved in, in the research here. People that have been involved in, in helping me with collections in the past uh, 30 years and also our funding agency. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions, and, and thanks again for listening. Okay, we have time for just a few questions. If you have a question, raise your hand. Come on, someone must have a question. Oh, here we go, here we go. Oh, what? Y'all can answer y'all questions. I gotta go, boy. I gotta go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Love me.